Good morning, West USA. Welcome to a, another edition of our Monday morning webinar. Uh, we trust that you had a wonderful weekend, but uh, hey, it's time to learn, it's time to grow, and it's time to figure out how to make more money because that's what it's all I about. Like that. All right. What is the hokey pokey all about? Did anybody ever figure that thing out? Yeah. No, I don't so think turn so. Yourself around. That's no, it. that's what it's about. Turn yourself around. All right. We digress. <laughs> 30 seconds in, we have digressed. Yeah. little sneak peek of what we got coming up today. Uh, Todd Menard's look at the numbers. We got actually Matt Baker from the Booksman Baker team here this morning to give us our mortgage minute. I'm going to continue our uh, conversation on uh, sales tips. So I'm going to give you three more uh, sales tips of the pros. Our master coach, Eric G., We'll be stopping by to discuss six ways having a coach can make you money faster. And I want to emphasize before people go, oh, I don't need a coach. It doesn't matter at what level. I think the assumption and the myth is that coaching is only for brand new agents. And our top producers and our team leaders who are excelling at, at the nth degrees, they have coaches. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Michael Jordan had extra coaches outside of the team. Uh, Tiger Woods, has, you know, everybody has if you want to play at that level. Yeah, Tiger just needed a marriage coach. That would have that would have helped out. And of course, uh, don't yeah. do that with Bob. And as always, if you've got any questions, comments, or suggestions of topics you'd like to discover to discuss, please feel free to email us at webinar at westusa.com. All right, Todd, what is going on in the market? Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, today is August 5th, so we're doing the, imagine that, August already. We're doing the week back uh, of the most recent seven days, plus a look at last month. So let's start off with a brief week-over-week -week look at 57 days closed on market. We have a 1.51 month supply of homes available in the in the uh, MLS, 66% uh, percent absorption rate, and an average list price hovering about 555000 and the sale price is hovering, uh, average sale price at three fifty. dollars um, Looking at list price to sale price retention, uh, this is really way too high, 98.9%. .9%. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, but that's the red flag for the day. Taking a look at inventory, inventory is, it, we've been talking about this uh, on the show for a couple of weeks now. Uh, inventory will I hate to say this, will be under 14,000 units more than likely uh, into the 13s next week. Um, taking a look at pending, we're sitting at 5,300. That's normal. That's average. It's not a strong number, but it's a it's a decent number. It's down just a little bit. Uh, closed units for the month, uh, we're going to be talking about last month, not the month of August. We closed at 9,309 units. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well when we get to the analysis portion. Looking at uh, new listings, we took 1,904 listings last week. That was up 10% about the week before, almost 12% actually. Uh, days on market is sitting at about 166 for the entire inventory and for closed inventory at 57 days. Taking a look at price ranges, uh, again, under $500,000 represents you know almost 71%, just over 71% of the market, uh, about 20, just under 20% for the 500 to a million market and just under 10% for a million plus. Taking a look at the week over week analysis, again, we looked at new listings up 1900, we were up to 12%. Uh, again, we like to see this number hovering somewhere around 2400 units a week. Uh, pending is sitting at 5300, uh, just down slightly from the previous week. Closed inventory, we'll talk about uh, when we get to the month of July. This is way too early in the month of August to have any real statistics for you. Uh, taking a look at the supply, though, we did drop from a 1.72% down to 1.51%, uh, and that is something that we're going to – that's down 12%. That's a pretty significant drop. We're going to have to take a look at that and keep uh, watching that over the next few weeks. Uh, absorption rate is still sitting at a staggering over 60% at 66%. That's the percentage of inventory that's being absorbed on a – on a monthly basis. So obviously at 50%, that would mean you have two months supply. So again, it just uh, works out as another interpretation of the way in which the inventory is ebbing and flowing. Looking at average list prices, uh, we're up to 554. Uh, it's been pretty steady. Uh, it's been even higher than that, as high as 570. Uh, so again, uh, you know, this is just another one of those ways to dispel this, this myth that's out there that we're in a bubble. Um, taking a look at the days on market where, uh, 
going to 57. This really needs to be somewhere around 70. We haven't seen 70 in quite some time. So anything, you know, as it remains below 70, what all that means is that uh, properties are closing quicker than on average. Uh, and then finally, list price to sale price retention is at 98.9. This basically means that the seller is only giving up about 1% now. 2.2 is, is normal. So this should be at 97.8%. Uh, but again, when it's up this high, it's telling you that the sellers are, you know, just saying, hey, I don't have to give up as much on my price. Now, whether they've already discounted the price or just the supply and demand, we're finally seeing the pressure. Uh, we'll have to take a look and see how that works. So looking at the month of July, we ended up uh, with 8,650 new listings. Last year, we were at 9,000 listings. Um, so again, we took uh, about 4%, almost 5% less listings uh, this year than we did last year, same period. Inventory uh, has actually been about the same. Last year, we were about 17,800 units in inventory. Uh, of course, this statistic includes pending. Uh, and we take, or excuse me, not pending, but under contract accepting backup offers. And if we take a look at, uh, we closed out July at 17,000, just under 17,000. 17,700. So again, good numbers, very, very consistent, very steady. And even the pace between last month and this month is, is, uh, is on the correct trend. Looking at pending across the board, we last year we hit 7,585 pending units. That means the average number of properties that were in escrow at any one time was 7,585 units. Uh, this past year, we were at 5,890. This past month, July, we were at 5,899. That's 22% less people with offers on properties. So this could be that people are more serious. It could be that uh, you know we we uh, just because inventory is tight, the people that aren't serious aren't aren't even in the marketplace. But the irony, but high the irony of the supply and demand equation is that taking a look at closed units, uh, last year we closed 8,500 units. This year we closed 9,300 units. So we were up 10% uh, almost uh, for over last year. So so understand the supply and demand curve. You, you know, if you've got 7,500 people that want to buy homes and you're closing 8,500 of them, uh, and this year you've got 5,900 people that have made decision to buy a home and you're closing 9,300 uh, units, that, that's, that's a good those are good numbers. So from that perspective, the market is exceptionally positive. Taking a look at the month's supply, um, again, we ended the month at just under 2%, 1.9%. Um, again, very consistent. Last year was 2.08%, so we're splitting hairs. Uh, and again, the difference between last month and last year, same period, and this month and last year, same period, um, we're doing a little better, a little stronger, up 5%. I think that's the most uh, important thing we can take away from that. Uh, but taking a look at sale prices again, you know, we it's we're at 571,000. We closed at the end of last uh, month. Uh, as we just talked about, we're at 555 right now. So you can see that, you know, we're not, uh, these numbers aren't uh, continually pushing the envelope moving higher because there's little demand. They're actually just ebb and flowing. Um, and so it's a good, again, it's, it's a really good sign. If consumers have any problem uh, with what's going on in the marketplace, it should be that uh, uh, it now's the time to get back in the game. We'll listen to Matt in just a few minutes, uh, listen to about the mortgage minute with uh, Mr. Baker, and we'll see exactly how the numbers are shaking out. Uh, and then finally, we closed the month at 97.2% uh, list price to sell price retention. Uh, again, we talked about 97.8 being the norm. So right now, Mike, the market just seems to be tightening up a little bit. So if we take a look at ways in which you can, other ways in which you can find uh, the market analysis online, obviously we're uh, trying to make sure everybody's aware that you can go to your Alexa and ask, hey Alexa, you know, what's my flash briefings? And automatically, uh, if you've selected West USA Realty Market Analysis, uh, you will be able to hear this report and it changes usually Mondays, sometimes on Tuesdays by the time we update the report. And the last way is taking a look at our uh, weekly Monday webinar recordings, which you can find. Uh, they include PowerPoint, so you get a little visual along with it. You can find those on youtube.com West US, uh, slash West USA Realty. So, uh, Mike, that's the numbers, and uh, we're holding to it. All right. I appreciate it, Todd. Thanks, and, Mike. And, and why they make things so confusing. So, yeah. we've got an Alexa in the kitchen, yeah. and now my waff, my waff, my wife. Your waffles? My <laughs> waffles. My <laughs> wife sometimes looks like a waffle. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I don't know. Um, we, we, <laughs> didn't, we, we didn't hear that. I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, so now we got one of those Google things oh, in, Google in the Home. bedroom. Yeah. So, I'm in there last night. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm like, Google. Google. She's like, no, you got to say, hey, Google. I'm like, why? Why has it got to be so difficult? Seriously. Between Alexa, Google, Siri, I mean, 
Yeah. You, 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 even the yell, difference. You were just yelling things. And yeah. 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 And a wife that looks like a waffle. I mean. <laughs> 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 right, Matt. You always set me up. You must so be. Much. You must. You must be hungry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> All let's, right, take it away, Matt. Yeah, What's let's going just on? Jump the, market? Into the numbers. Last week, uh, you know, as as we made you all aware, we have the Fed announcement, right? And so the Fed said they were going to lower rates uh, a quarter of a percent. And, and as we had indicated previously, that doesn't necessarily mean that mortgage rates are going to drop a quarter. Right. Um, it's not that they're not directly correlated. What 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 happened was is that the, the Fed had already. You know, we had already, as the market economists, had already asserted that that the rates were gonna were, were already priced in, right? Rates had improved over the last few months with the anticipation of the Fed lowering rates. You can see here today that conventional has really dipped under the four from yeah. a um, you know from a, a quoting perspective three nine nine. Um, there is some points and fees in there. That's why their APR is such. Uh, and then again, FHA in the low fours. One thing I wanted to note. That so Wednesday when the Fed made their announcement, uh, the market was flat because they said you're going to lower a quarter, and 100% of people thought that they were going to lower a quarter. So it wasn't that wasn't what moved the rates. What moved the rates um, actually a little bit better the next day was the fact that uh, the president made the tariff comments mm -hmm. because then that that created some more uncertainty. Because one thing that the um, chairman Powell Fed. Chairman Powell had indicated was that, well, that this trade uncertainty is a risk, as uh, a downside risk to the potential economy. And so when that when you hear those words, it puts pressure on rates going lower. And so that that was um, favorable from the mortgage perspective, not necessarily from your stock portfolio perspective, as indicated <laughs> right. by the morning drop. So just know that um, that they don't always work together and and know that going forward, um, these are things that that is dr help driving the market. People are definitely staying engaged. If you click to the next one, we're going to do a little um, game of loans. Um, not all deals must die. Is winter coming? Yeah. <laughs> well, I know. I walked not, outside today. Winter's no, not coming. It's not today. Not with us. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's the point um, today. I've had two deals close uh, in the last two weeks. One was a, uh, we did it in eight days. Uh, we saved it from another mortgage bank uh, mistake. Uh, they um, t told them two days before closing uh, that they couldn't close. Jeez. And, uh, you know, we get the call. I'm like, can you help? And I said, let me send me this, send me your stuff. And we, we look at their, their file and we're able to, um, you know, creatively leave the loan as a conventional. Um, we closed it conventional. We were able to get their appraisal transferred. And that obviously helped speed Nine the time. Days, and we wow. were able to get it done in eight days. And I can tell you, you know, from a client for life perspective, yeah. not that I always want to cash in all those chips, but it definitely was nice to to be able to do that and sure. and see the reaction and the thank um, thank all of you know all partners were thankful on top of the clients. Uh, and then the second one I've got is a VA deal that um, the other lender was a big you know, big dot com and they just couldn't get out of their own way, right? Nickel and diamond the client. He's getting super frustrated. Uh and you know, we we were able to come in and save the deal and we're doing that in 10 days. Um, wow. that's close supposed to close on Friday. So the moral of the story is you got a deal falling out, call Maddie, get it done in two a, weeks. A, no, right, we, well, a Lannister <laughs> always closes his loan. That's oh, right. Oh, I like yeah, that. Yeah. that was yeah. good. Yeah. I gotta hire you in the marketing department. <laughs> um <laughs> So that's, I mean, I think that- You're looking like a waffle right now, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, uh, you yeah. know? <laughs> I think the point of the conversation when it gets to what, why the Books Van Baker team and why, you know, why the fairway, it's it's just the way that we attack loans. And I think from, from a pre-approval perspective, you know, doing all that stuff at the front end, getting all like- knowing how to structure it the right way to get it through and and to be able to you know not every loan is created equal right and you have to move things around in in the package you can't just you have to be strategic in what you show mm. and how you show it and that process and knowing what your underwriter will or won't accept is really where i feel like we why we excel um right it's why it's why we you know it used to be over 20 percent of our business when we were saving the big box lenders mistakes you know now we're seeing every lend. you know it doesn't matter the loan officer where they're from you know we we make mistakes that other people make mistakes we just limit them by having this process where it's not up to the loan officer no offense you know i'm good at 
I'm not good at all things, right? And you know, analyzing all the ins and outs of what it takes to close a loan file and all the fraud checks and all the different things you have to do, it's really quite intense. And so most companies rely on the loan officer to do all that work. Well, we just have built a team to do that for us to allow us to go out there and make sure we're communicating and selling and communicating to our agents about the deal and getting the next deal rather than spending in the weeds on how to get the deal to work. And so that really, I think, is what sets apart the Bookspan Baker team specifically and Fairway in that, you know, we just want to get things done and one and, time and, touch and, it and once. Get, it, get it done and structure it the right way yep. the first time. I hear you. All right, Matt. Appreciate That's it awesome. as always. Um, and uh, I think, um, well, we'll talk. Hopefully, we'll talk about our announcement. Well, coming up, but in, in about a month and a half on National Cheeseburger Day, Oop. we're coming down to Fairway downtown to your Ooh, headquarters, yeah. and uh, we got a food, tr a burger truck burgers. coming, and uh, burgers and waffles. Shut the front, burger on a wall. Shut the know, front door. I was what? Just about to say, how about it? We take a burger. I've seen them where, like, instead of the buns, it's uh, they're donuts. I've seen that. Uh, but what about waffles? That would be ingenious. With donuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're on to something. All right. All we're right. going to create some stuff down there. Besides mortgages, we're going to create some uh, unique burgers. Memories. Experience. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Matt. Appreciate yeah. it as always. All right. Moving right along, uh, Todd, to our um, our three-pack. Uh, last yeah. week, we started a series, uh, three series right? on the sales tips from the pros. And so we're going to continue the topic today. Uh, just analyze and taking a look at what other like perfect now I gotta say professional we're all professionals, but what excelling salespeople do in order to be excelling at sales. So first one for today is a good salesperson is asking the right questions. Mm. Uh, we always say uh, on uh, on the webinar to ask questions and spend 70% of the time listening. But then it just kind of dawned on me, are we asking the right questions? It's not enough just to ask questions and get the uh, get the buyer or the seller to talk. It's asking them to r the right questions. And I always like to say as, as real estate professionals and as salespeople, we are private investigators. That's really what we do. We are putting on our private investigator hat to learn as much as we can to basically solve the puzzle and, and to solve the problem. And, and the goal is to meet um, our clients' needs and solve their problems. But it does start, it's not enough just to ask the questions. You really have to go in, go in and asking the right questions. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously we know that there's sales technique involved in asking open-ended questions where questions that people can't say yes or no to, they have to give you a sentence back, uh, which which kind of promotes them communicating. But you're right, Mike. I mean, we, we really rarely talk about asking the right question. Um, you know, it, it's it's kind of the same thing, which is, you know, are you interested in buying or selling your home or what are your obstacles? You know, the question is, if you're not attaching those to pain points or pleasure points, then then the reality is you're really not getting that emotional answer back that's going to help you trip those switches in their head. So I, I think that that's something that maybe down the road, we should maybe mm -hmm. put on something that, that says, hey, here's here's the example or here's 10 questions or maybe get Eric or somebody to come back with, you know, and help us help everybody understand what are good questions to ask. Yeah. And, and for starters, I mean, you know, I mean, you have to find out what is motivating them to buy or sell. Is it, is, is it schools that are important? Is it neighborhoods that are important? Is it, is it commute time that's important? Uh, you know, and, and really just digging deep because when you really figure out exactly what it is they're looking for. The worst thing that you can do and the worst thing that you want to do as an agent is is to show someone homes and they're in the back of their mind going, this agent didn't listen to me. Right. This is this is not at all. And sometimes it's not a matter of that we're not listening. It's a matter of we're not asking the right questions. Exactly. It's more than just how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, uh, what city and what sales price. OK, those are those are basic questions. Right. But that but you could still end up showing people the wrong home. And the minute that you do that, it becomes yeah. a very frustrating process yep. for them. Number two, I like this. This is going to hurt. Uh oh, this is going to hurt a lot of people. Ow. Would you buy from you? No. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's that's like Did looking in the mirror and Lying really yourself? analyzing no. yourself. Uh, you know, because here's what we know. People buy from those they like and trust. If they don't, they don't like you or they don't trust you, they will not buy. Well, I said form, but they will not buy from you. And the big question is, do you come off as trustworthy and likable? Uh, I do this a lot when I, when I sell and, and different things that I'm doing. Um, I, you know, I when I'm done, 
I, I spend time evaluating. I do. I spend time evaluating the conversation, uh, evaluating whether I achieved my goals, evaluating how I came off. Did I come off as, you know, there's a, there's a side of me that, that is not necessarily endearing <laughs> during a sales presentation. Um, was I listening? Was I asking the right questions? But at the end of the day, um, you know, some, sometimes people aren't buying from us because, yeah, well, you know, us. they don't, yeah, because of us. <laughs> I don't know the kindest way to say this. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sure you've maybe experienced this. You've, you've gone to a car dealership, and of course, an, Car dealerships have a – the consumer's perception is horrible about the experience, right? You know, I mean, I'm not saying every dealership, so don't hold me accountable to that one. But but that seems to be that they're, you know, one level above a belly button to a snake. So the thing is, is that, you know, if you take a look at the process, how many times, though, have you been there and you found a really nice salesperson? I mean, they they had all the charisma. They asked yep. good questions, you know, and, and the money wasn't there, but you wanted to buy from that person, yeah. you know, so you, you – you, you paid maybe more than you were said you would pay because you enjoyed the experience with that particular person. And I think that's a great way to look at this particular one, at least one way to look at it, which is, you know, what were the attributes of people that you've done business with that the price wasn't right, but yet, you know, all the other characteristics were there. What, what were they demonstrating? And, you know, maybe we can learn to, to add some of those things to, or improve what we do. Yeah, and the other thing too is some of us, maybe if we're having a hard time closing the deal, some of us are going into our sales presentations with just facts, figures, and and processes, and 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 really, frankly, maybe to a point, a little bit boring. Uh, rather than you know, you have to go in, you have to, you do, you have to be likable, you you have to have uh, some personality. It's you are selling yourself, mm -hmm. you're not selling the product, and and sometimes we are so focused on the product, product. and the processes rather than ourselves because again people will only buy from you if they trust you and like you so so let's just and, and i know i gotta get to number three but you know let's just talk about telephone calls for a minute in, in comes a lead call right and and we've been taught for so long convert 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 close them close them set an appointment set an appointment set an appointment that we forget to have a conversation with these people and find out yeah. what their needs are to so to the point ask the right questions but when you're on the telephone stop trying to close these people just try to create a relationship exactly it, yeah and then that leads to and that's a great segue into then the third one is focus on building rapport uh in order to build rapport with someone we have to invest time in and sometimes we are you're right todd we are we are trained to convert and close ASAP, but we're asking people to trust us to make one of the largest, if yeah. not the largest financial decisions of their life. And it's not that simple. Okay, the, the cute little girl in front of Walmart selling me Girl Scout cookies, that's an easy conversion. Okay, I'm yep. giving up five bucks. Yep. Uh, they, you don't have you, you don't have to do much. We don't really need a, a, a rapport, but you always have me at Thin Mint. Yeah. Um, but. <laughs> But you know, we, we have to think about this. Okay, yeah. I'm asking you to get a loan for three, four hundred thousand dollars. You're gonna put X amount of thousands of dollars down. You're trusting me to find you the right property to raise your family in. Uh, and but it, it does take that time to build rapport. And again, the best way to do it is invest mm -hmm. time. And it just goes back to number one, but it's focus yeah. on their motivation. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot on this one because it, it just really says it right in that focus on building rapport. That's the answer. That's the question, but it's also the answer. Um, you know, and, and I think that uh, ultimately the more we try to, I, I still think that Michael Mayer book, that seven levels of communication speaks to this so perfectly. Mm -hmm. You know, if you haven't read it yet, I reach, I, I wish you all would go out and get it. It's called the seven levels of communication. It's, it's by uh, Michael Mayer and, uh, and it'll help you with this one. I, uh, I maintain that if, uh, if you just, read the book once a year and just followed it yeah that, if you that is the the one of the fewest books that actually is a business plan mm -hmm. that really right there is your business plan if you did what he says in that book yep. you would be you'd be fine all, all right. right um i do need to apologize to to the rock out there because apparently when i said um, hey google it, yeah. uh, it alerted and activated his phone oh so hey google order me a pizza all right, and so deliver you're welcome. It, and deliver it to 2355 <laughs> West Utopia. <laughs> All right, uh, moving right along to a few announcements uh, that we got coming up. Uh, coming to Mesa this Friday, really, really excited about this. Uh, now, every once in a while, we get to travel around and bring our pro secrets on tours. Uh, I don't know really what else to say. 
um, if, if you don't see the value yeah. in this, then probably you should just stop listening to the webinars altogether because education is not something of value yeah. to you. Yeah, I mean, because this is, this is, and I, I'm not saying if you can't go, you can't go, that's fine. Right. But if you just don't see the value in hearing from West USA's top producers on how they become, how they've become successful and have a chance to ask them questions. Um, I, I don't yeah. really know what to say. So it's coming up this Friday. This is in lieu of the Mesa office meeting. However, uh, we, you do need the RSVP. Uh, we, we have the uh, email up there and Sydney's going to send you out the link as well. You do not have to be a member of the Mesa office to oh, attend this. Point. Yep. Uh, also, if uh, you're talking with and you got some friends from other brokerages, um, this is open to all Every event we do is open to right. all companies, uh, all brokerages. So uh, get signed up for this. We want to see you on a Friday. Uh, it's going to be just a great chance for you to hear from, again, from our top producers. Listen to their secrets and how they are experiencing a success. Uh, also, I've got a couple of uh, building an effective closed Facebook group class going, uh, coming up. We have one coming up August 14th uh, in the Chandler area. So this is really for our Chandler, Awatuki, and Mesa offices. I'm going to take you step by step on how to build a, what the difference is between a Facebook business page and what the difference is between a closed Facebook group, how agents are using these to generate quality leads. Uh, and we're going to take you step by step through that process. Yep. So get signed up for it. There is the email there for you. We're going to send that out to you as well. Uh, and then our own uh, Keith Flynn, speaking of Facebook, uh, he is going to talk about the the Facebook uh, business page side of things and changes. Facebook's oh constantly gosh. making changes. I know. Uh, so you really need to be on top of that. So uh, we're going to be doing that up here at the uh, corporate office. Uh, and so uh, Keith Flynn's going to be – I'm trying to – you know, I know he listens to this. I'm trying to think of another way to make fun of him. Because uh, I make fun of the fact that he's just a Notre Dame fan. It's just yeah, not working out. That's so. right. Fighting Irish, go. Fighting Irish. All right. Anyway, so uh, sorry, Keith. I will find uh, another way to make fun of you. But anyways, uh, get signed up. He really is knows what he's talking about. He does, yeah. And so then lastly, I'm going to do another one of these closed Facebook groups uh, coming up August 21st. West Side. At, uh, West Side at American Title. This is a part of DJ Christic's, uh Realtor Rehab Series um, so if you don't want to go to the East Valley, come to the West side, August 21st. Again, um, we're looking for really unique ways to generate leads and get business instead of doing the same old, same old. And I really think that, uh, these close Facebook groups uh, are underused right now by agents. Eventually it'll be like everything else. It'll be saturated, but this is your chance to get in and this is your chance to learn how uh, to do it. All right, Eric G. Hey, Mike. How are you? You got to get close to the microphone, but hey, pal. Yeah. Yeah. Good day. <laughs> <Same thing. laughs> All right, so Eric, for those of you that don't know Eric G., he is the master coach in charge of our coaching program here at West USA. Our coaching program is one of the probably the most highly effective programs that we have here at West USA outside of the Burger Club, there you go. Uh, yeah. which is coming up a week from tomorrow. Ooh, so sweet. go to americasburgerclub.com uh, and get signed up for that. We're going to be at Wally Burger. Pretty oh. dang excited about that. Uh, but anyways, uh, so six benefits to the coaching program, Eric. So um, I like what you did here. So we're going to start with the entrepreneurial side of, of, of the coaching program and, and so forth. But uh, before we get started, comment on my comment earlier um, where I think the assumption is that the coaching program is only for brand new agents and then that couldn't be further from the truth. That couldn't be further from the truth. No. I, I've been a broker for 20 years and I still have a coach even today. I meet with them once a week and talk for at least 20 minutes. But there's so much to be gained from just having that sense of accountability and talking to somebody in the same context of what you're trying to accomplish and your goals. You know, everybody comes in at different levels into this industry. And even if you've been here for 20 years doing this, there's never ending opportunities to correct and to keep you in line with what your habits should be and to, and to really get out of the way of yourself sometimes because you're, you're always trying to get to that goal, but, but life gets in the way and, and sometimes you don't even realize it. And, and knowing that there's somebody there to endorse your positive habits and to correct you when they see things that are off track that they know that are not within your um, 
scheme of things that, that you can correct for. But having somebody there is really the accountability. And it's not like a, a, a overbearing father or something. It's the consistency of having somebody who supports you on the same level, if not greater, than what you're trying to do with your own goals. What I, what I find amazing is is one of uh, the benefits to what I do here at West USA is um, I get to work hands on with our top producers and our team leaders. And when you lump our agents into who are our top producers and who are our team leaders, uh, and oftentimes they're the same. Uh, our top producers, then there's a higher echelon of top producer. Yep. And then there's also a higher echelon of team leader, the teams that are, who are really killing it. And when I look at them almost to the one, they all have coaches and we're yeah. talking about agents who are doing 40, 50, 60 transactions a year. They have coaches. And I say, th- I say they're doing 40, 50, 60 deals a year because not only do they have a coach, but they've, they've hired the right coach. Right. And they're, yeah. they're fully committed to their business as well and to the goals that they've set to build the business. Um, there's really no other way around it, I think. Uh, and as the director of the coaching program, and you know, I built so much of what we have done here. I didn't come in with nothing. I had a lot handed to me when we started and it was phenomenal uh, work, but what we've done is really kind of, re-envisioned, I think, how agents actually operate inside of this industry. And what I wanted to do with the program when I came on board was to take it from a perspective of really looking at the forest from the trees. And so what I did with it was start with a questionnaire. And we want to know, first of all, what are the needs of this agent? What are the specific needs that they're trying to, to accomplish in this program? Uh, and that's our first duty to the agents is really within the program. What are you trying to get out of this relationship with a coach? What do you feel your deficiencies are? And so we use a questionnaire. It's about two and a half pages where they go through and they get to think about introspectively why they got into the business, how much money do they really need and, and some goals that they think they want to accomplish. And then after that, we go, well, let's take a look at this industry. You can go through ProStart and you can go through React and, and come out of that like you took a drink from a fire hydrant and everybody does. And they don't really know where to start. How do they put all of these things in order for themselves? And that's what the coaching program is going to help do because we really have the relationship with the coach. And then we have the structure of the course curriculum. And the way that I've designed that is we've got the entrepreneurial aspect of the industry. And then we've got the technical transaction into the industry. And, and that's so, what these six points are. All right. All so about. let's jump into the entrepreneurial uh, side. So we'll start with business planning and strategy. Okay. So, Todd, you did a great job of building that business plan, and we still use it today. Um, we really take that plan and we start with, okay, well, what are the income goals? Realistically, let's start talking about money and what do you need to get through this industry and on a month by month, annual basis, however it is, what do you need to actually make this industry and profession happen for you? So we use the business plan to reverse engineer really realistically what you're in for in terms of how many prospects it's going to take. Uh, all the way down to how many closings. So it's an attrition thing. So we're working with the plan. Now with that, we can say, okay, I need so many prospects every month in order to get to this many closings, to get to this income goal. With that, now we've got the goals. So we're setting up our business with the plan and we're establishing our financial goals and we're creating a market plan out of that. And that's what it's all about. We have to work it by design and and put things in strategic order. Now, working with a coach is gonna help bring all of that together. But the business plan is really starting to set up your strategy and your budgets and really what your personal expectations are working with the coach. Um, After the business planning and strategic organization, we're looking for goal accountability. Okay. So goal accountability is just like we just talked about, you know, that's the premise behind working with a coach to begin with. But again, we're looking to get the genie out of the bottle as it was. (laughs) So if you had a goal and you wrote it down, that's only one little snippet of what you need to get that goal to happen. If you took that piece of paper and stuck it in your wallet, you really don't have a goal. (laughs) But if you said what that goal was and presented it to your best friend or to your spouse or to your coach, you can find, wow, the genie's out of the bottle. Now I have a personal sense of accountability to myself more than anything. And the fact that, that, you know, we want to be good, productive 
people in society and get get my goals done and build my business. So now you've shared it and now you've got to be accountable to your um, honesty with yourself. You uh, and it's not about, like I said, having an overbearing person talk about why didn't you do your goals this week? Why didn't you do your, your, your work? Um, it's not about that at all. So the next aspect of the entrepreneurial theme is prospecting skills and habits. It is so important to know that prospecting skills and habits are really the backbone to your whole business. It is. Are they not? I, I always maintain in, in our orientations um, that, I mean, I get through two hours of this is how great West USA is. Here's all the tools. Here's everything. But you literally, if you did this one thing, you could throw everything away. And that one thing is every single day, uh, time blocking three hours, uh, at least three hours, and just prospect. Yep. And if you yeah. just did that, but you have to get into that habit and it's got to be a daily thing. There are salespeople out there and I know because I get 10 calls a day. This is what they do eight, nine hours a day is yeah. they call people, right? And try to sell them. Well, you can't do that for eight hours a day because you got to go out show homes because you've been prospecting for three hours a day. But I tell them if you just did that, you would earn six figures well, absolutely. in the next 12 yeah, months. Totally. No, it's, it's so true because – You've got to prospect all the time. And even if you did that only one thing, there is an army of people waiting in line to help you get through that transaction because they all have a money stake in that transaction too. Your title people, your mortgage people, everybody in the company, uh, they want to see that transaction close. So don't even worry about it. You just you know, got to you know, get that's the a, business happening. That's an awesome point, Eric, because you know most programs, you just got to pay per month. I mean, it, it's like my coach was a thousand dollars a month, and right. so you know the thing is, is that it, I'm still it, waiting for that last payment. By the way, pal. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> payment will be huge. Yeah. So the th but the th again, it, it just it just boils back to the fact that that's an upfront fee. You've got a fiduciary, so the fiduciary is not interested in the outcome. They it, they, they have nothing. They have no interest in the outcome whatsoever. Um, and yet, it, our coaches, the way you've you've created this, our coaches don't take money up front. They work with that individual agent till the agent closes something and then gets a piece of the transaction right. for that period of time. So, so there's no, there should, there's no barriers to entry for the average person. And if you, and yeah. you know, a hundred percent of zero is still zero. Yeah. You know, I'd rather get a piece of something and then know that I'm building my business. Well, uh, every, every, every business invests in itself. Yeah, exactly. And this is part of investing yourself. Yeah. And I just want to say to the business planning and strategy, uh, one of our favorite shows in the, at the Weinstein house is, uh, is um, Shark Tank, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and you know we lo we love the whole process. And I actually know some people that that have been on Shark Tank and, and actually were on and went through the the whole deal. But what they never show you on TV because it's so dang boring mm -hmm. is that one of the first things that they ask for when 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 a shark invests in a company is where's the business plan? Yeah, because that is going to tell me everything that I need to know about where you're at as an entrepreneur. Now that would be terrible TV rating, yeah. but you can't go into a bank and get a business loan without a business plan. You have, you ha yep, and, and right. so many of our agents are doing this without a business plan. Yeah. Yeah. No, you've got to have it organized. I mean, and, it, and it's just professional certainly. And if you think you get back onto the prospecting that is within the entrepreneurial aspect of it. And so we have a lot of agents that get into real estate, without ever having experience in that. They may come from an employee background and they've never actually took the step outside of that realm mm -hmm. to become self-employed. And they just wake up one day and, and I have to tell agents like, well, you woke up unemployed. Yeah. And so you better get to it. <laughs> Every single day when you're an entrepreneur, you're unemployed. Yeah. <laughs> I remember we, we, we had a former person here. We won't uh, say his name, but I always said it that he always said that the greatest uh, motivational book in the world. And I always tell, ask people that, what do you think the most, the, the most motivational book in the world? And everybody says the Bible. It's like, nope, checkbook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All yeah. right. Let's talk about the uh, trans transactional. I was just seeing whether I spelled it right there. Uh, transactional benefits of the coaching program. All right. So it's the second world and it's really everything that has to do with real estate part and parcel. Um, now, the way I'm looking at it, I mean, I'm just looking at three points here, but there's so much more to it than that. Document knowledge, negotiations and market knowledge. So in document knowledge, um, a seasoned agent should have a pretty good grasp of that but we still find a lot of agents don't and we still find agents that are at the point where I've got to write an offer and okay, great. Let's go ahead and get it written, uh, written up and let's talk to the coach and, and see how it went. Let, let's take a look and see what you got. And they've never even read it. <laughs> they've never even read it. 
So what we do as part of the task assignments in the coaching program within the curriculum is we do what's called anatomy of a purchase agreement. Okay, now we discover so many of the other documents that we use on a regular basis, but the anatomy of a purchase agreement is really critical. We've got 10 pages of how many lines are in it, Todd? Do you remember? No, no, it's four, no, it's four, the whole thing's about 400 and something, 420. 420. So I cannot believe Todd does not know no, the answer no, to I that don't. question. I, I am taking such great I know. joy <laughs> I know. because the fact that you could quote we talk about a specific yeah. item in the, well, in the contract and he yeah. can give me the line yeah, number. True. Right, right. You know, yeah. <laughs> so the anatomy of a purchase agreement, really the premise Thanks, is Mike. again, the, the forest from the trees. And we want to back away from every single line and go, okay, well, what, what, what are the core things happening in this agreement? What are we doing as an agreement between the parties? So you got to read it. And then you've got to identify every clause as being one of only three things. We can count to three, everybody. Hmm. You're only one of three things happening or three things happening in the purchase agreement. It's an agreement of the parties. It's going to be a disclosure or it's going to be a contingency. Every clause in the purchase agreement should be one of those things. And sometimes they overlap. Hmm. And that's why I get other agents that, and coaches that say, well, wait a minute, that could be a contingency or not, whatever. But the point is, identify it with one of those three things. And what we're looking for are the contingencies because that's where the rubber hits the road and that's where the earnest money gets lost and has to be paid for by the agent. So we wanna know that purchase agreement inside and out in every document. Um, fill them out fictitiously, deliver them to your coach and work it through and see the things that are not really comprehending from a knowledge point of view. Um, the next thing we wanna do is negotiations. Now, if you if you never really worked a, or, or had been in a profession that you had to negotiate things, then you're completely off base because you're negotiating every single day Everything. with your kids and with your wife. And you know who the, the worst terrorists in the world are. Uh, they're your children because you can't negotiate with them for nothing. <laughs> um, but you, it's all about negotiation. And we're trying to create a win-win situation too. There's, we don't, my, me and my children, we don't negotiate. I simply just get violated. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You By their Jedi time. mind tricks. Yep, yep. <laughs> Um, we want to have a win-win between the parties. Uh, negotiating with your client is something that I think a lot of agents overlook. They think of this industry as something that they're negotiating with the agent on the other side, um, but they're actually negotiating with their own clients in many cases. In fact, they should be all the time in determining what they need and what they're realistically expecting to get out of this transaction. And sometimes they're unrealistic. And so to get that transaction closer to closing, because both agents on both sides of the transaction they know the drill for the most part, but it's really the, the customers and the clients that are really I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on my marketing hat for a second. I mean, and so people should be paying me right now for the advice I'm gonna give you. Okay, remember how we said earlier, it, it goes back down to meeting the needs of our clients, finding out yep. what their problems are. Okay, they don't care your designations. Nope. They don't care how many years you've been in the business. They don't care how many deals that they've closed. A buyer wants to buy a home for the best possible price. A seller wants to get the most amount of money in the quickest amount of time. Yep. There it is. Okay. They, you should be selling yourself as a negotiator. There are programs out there that you can get certified as mm -hmm. a negotiator because that's what people want and that's what people need. Uh, and that's what we are. We, we yeah. have to emphasize not only, but in order to do that, we have to know how to negotiate sure. properly. Right. Oh, yeah, there's right. so many specific strategies behind it as well. And if, and if you actually knew half a dozen specific negotiating strategies, you can see them coming a mile oh, away. Yeah. Yeah. You really can and yeah. know where it's gonna go. So the last thing, uh, market knowledge, um, what is a CMA? It's an art and a science. Ooh, so, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so really learning how to do that can take years to do a CMA uh, and knowing your market demographic, assessing where your farm area uh, or, or everything about your farm area, basically, and, and knowing how to acquire that information. So there's so much technical stuff I haven't even uh, touched on um, that an agent needs to know. But really, the the seasoned agent yeah there's there's so much room for improvement out of the vast majority of people in this industry it's amazing so we talked a lot about um a lot of the key things i think the takeaway from some of our listeners might have been yeah great um i'm already doing 10 million a year you know but again they can they can plug into this process um, anywhere along their career. And what this does is it gets them to realize that there's other aspects of their business that they may not be as successful in, even though they're selling a lot of houses. I mean, how do you have a, a good home life and a good business career and all these different things? I mean, all these types of things are, when you say there's so much more we haven't talked about, 
this is what you guys help the agent navigate through this whole right. process. And it is navigating. Yeah. It, it's, 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 we're building wherever they design. are today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're, and you're so right. You know, Mike, uh, I've seen a lot of agents in my brokerage that would come in and once a week, they close the door and they put a little sign on the, on the door handle and lock themselves in there for an hour and a half. And all they would do is prospect because the best agents will know that they have so much business going on. How do you, how do you keep spinning all of those plates on the stick? You know, when, every time I, uh, if you get the opportunity to go out to the Mesa office in the morning, uh, Dave Larson's one of my favorites, uh, cause he does this and uh, he's one of our top producers, but, yep. yeah. um, but he doesn't close his door. No, he doesn't. And, no, he lets everybody hear. and, and every morning, every time I'm there yep, early in the morning, the he's, he's, He's just on the phone. He's cranking it. And oh my God. So if you were a newer agent, I would, I, well, if I was a newer agent, I'd be I camping right outside his door. Right around the door <laughs> Sorry, I, Dave. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you'll be closing his door people. now. <laughs> Dave's going to be like, what the heck? Yeah, you gave away oh, my secret. Right. Okay. Um, so how do we get started in the coaching yeah. program? I, we got your email address up there. Um, I forgot the phone number, which is obviously the uh, West USA number 602. 942 4200 but what's the process well the first point of contact is either going to be me or it's going to be the um uh, the branch manager now i'm going to be the best person to answer any questions that someone may have about what are the terms of getting into coaching and how long do i have to be there how many transactions todd how many transactions does it take to be a proficient realtor when it when my favorite definition of the word success is when your income or or well it's when you can cover your expenses <laughs> you know that's the first thing and maintain well, for, your health your your lifestyle i mean you know the way well you, i mean I guess, I guess the question was how many transactions do you think you need to go through in order to have a good comprehension of how a transaction uh, unfolds three three i uh i don't know i want to say yeah. between six and seven now yeah bob throw a number at us how many transactions does it take to uh, be a proficient realtor? <laughs> Bob is laughing yeah, in we, the back. If, yeah, I was going to say. If we, if He's doing his, his, his yeah. best Ed McMahon yeah. uh, imitation yeah. over there. It should take three. They should be proficient by that time if they've gone to the coaching program. There you go. Oh, well, there you go. I look at it like eight, 12, yeah. you know, give it a few years worth of transactions. You. Yeah. It takes a lot. You're going to see so many different things, uh, but they're going to get a hold of me. I'm going to answer every question that they would have about how it works, what the expectations are, and, um, and then the managers will get them plugged in. We really align agents with the best possible coach. You're not in line with, with the availability or anything like that. We really, I want to know what these agents are bringing to the table and align them with the like-minded type of um coach that, that I think they're going to have a great relationship with. And that's what we do. So many of our agents who leave the coaching program after graduating out, they're still working with our coaches. You know, yeah. they're not formally together on a regular basis, but they negotiate yeah. and, and talk to each other and, and strategize and they're still working. Yeah. All right. Eric, uh, really good stuff. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And my, I would just only implore our uh, audience out there yeah. to, um, if you've not never hired a coach, I don't care what level you're at. Uh, to at the very least consider it and, and talk with a coach or talk with Eric. Um, we are, you know, this, this, this industry is changing totally. on a daily oh, yeah. basis and, and the competition out there is coming up in different forms and different ways. And, um, and it's just, I don't know. I feel like this is an industry not designed to be done alone. All right, Eric, yep. appreciate it as always. Yeah, Thanks, cool. buddy. Thanks. All appreciate right. It. All right. All right. As Bob, uh, comes up i just want to remind everybody next tuesday uh we're going to be at wally burger for our next america's a burger club uh what's really nice about these burgers the bun you know those hawaiian sweet rolls oh yeah those are the buns no they are yeah they are that's awesome yeah maybe we could talk eric g into coming if yeah. you want all right all right eric's coming next tuesday sydney you got yeah. that all right bob uh, appreciate you joining us i uh, yeah. hope you had a great weekend help us stay out of trouble i wish i could stay out of trouble on those freeways my goodness <laughs> Five miles an hour for miles and miles and miles this morning. Somebody must have been in an accident somewhere, but it wasn't me. I'm glad of that anyway. There we go. Staying out of trouble, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, we'll start off here with the... Um, one of the agents was asked for the buyer's advisory... Uh, course that's our buyer but the other company wanted that also they wanted a copy of that signed by our buyer 
What's the answer? Nope. No. N O O P. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't hurt that they get it. It, it. it isn't a big issue, but no, no, that's not in the contract. It just uh, points out that we can get it signed, and I'm glad we do get it signed because it, it, it's got a lot of stuff in there. Actually, if a buyer went through that thing and did all those things in there, you'd have to give them a full day to go through it before they even bought a house. So that's a, that's a big a big issue, and it, does it get rid of problems? Uh, it probably makes problems because <laughs> they, they, gotta, they, they keep asking us, what does that mean? Well, you've got to know what it means. You should read one of those things. It is amazing, the stuff that's in there. Uh, it was fixed up by ADRE and AAR working on this thing, and, and they got it pretty darn good. Even then, there's things that sometimes the agents forget. All right. There, there wasn't... Um, uh, well, there's a few things that happen. Here's, for instance, I got this call uh, when I was waiting to get waited on in a restaurant, actually. Here's a, a post-possession. They gave someone post-possession a closed Friday, give them post-possession to vacate by 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. Agent called me up and says, they're not out. Do you think? Now, what do you, <laughs> what, what do I do? <laughs> Well, you know what you better do is cooperate with them and help them a little bit. Don't make them feel really bad because they may uh, go the other way with you or something. Uh, th th there isn't anything you can do except serve them a five-day notice to get out of there and then get a lawyer and go to court. And so you've got three to four weeks tied up there trying to bail them out of there. So you need to be nice to them understand them, try to help a little bit. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe you can load the truck or something. I, I don't know. And has have agents done that? Yeah. Yeah. And over the years I've been in the business, yeah, they've, they've helped them do things like that. And I, um, here, here's a fellow that, that called me and said, I've got a Benzer cancel. Somebody canceled with a Benzer. Uh, but they didn't put a reason down there. Do they have to put a reason? Yeah, that's what the contract states. You got to put a reason. Well, what do you do in case they don't? Well, there, there are earnest monies at stake in here, actually, in a way, but still you need to send a cure notice out to them to, to, get, the, uh, to get that reason in there. And uh, you can't argue about the reason. That's, it's in their sole discretion as far as repairs go. And many times we get arguments about, well, that isn't a big deal. Well, I don't care what you think. It's my sole discretion, and that's it. I wrote it there. I don't like the neighborhood. I, there, there's different things I don't like here. What are, I only have to put one down there. That's all I got to do. So that's a, that's a, a tune that goes on every day, every day, every day. So it's, it's uh, fun to play it all the time, <laughs> or is it? I don't know. Um, oh, we had uh, one fellow here that wanted to get only the wife's signature on the listing. Oh, he understood when I said, no, don't do that. Uh, get both signatures on there. Well, I thought I could get this started because he's not available right now. So anyway, and, and that's a real estate myth that won't die, and I wrote something on that once. And, and why is it that we need both signatures? Here, here's one right in here. And this happened here at West USA. We had a husband and wife that owned a rental. He wanted to sell it, and an agent took the listing but did not have the wife sign it. So an accept, acceptable offer came in, which he signed, but his wife would not sign the offer. As time went by, we found out why she would not sign. And it turned out she was having an affair with the tenant and wanted him to stay on. 
as a tenant and therefore would not sell the rental. So there was more to that story than you think, but we want to get both signatures. So we want to make sure everybody's on board with these things. Otherwise we'll have a problem later on. There, there's always something. And when you put it in the MLS with only one signature and you're asking 40,000 agents to sell this for you, you're offering them some money to sell it. And so they go out and do it for you, but you can't. So that, turns into a problem too i i don't know uh, hopefully that doesn't happen very often here's a, a fella that uh it was in the mls that this is being sold as is so he got an offer on it and he says do i have to honor that as is thing it sells in the mls as is absolutely I said, well, yeah, maybe so. Maybe they won't uh, sign anything uh, as you're going along here, but you still have the right to inspect it, no matter what they say in the MLS. You have the right to inspect it and to cancel it if you don't like it. Or you can ask them to fix something, and they may they may change your mind or something. I don't know. But if they don't, then you can cancel it. So there's... Things going on there, you want to make sure that you can negotiate some of these things. Um, you know, I'm getting rid of a lot of books. I, I, I don't want to name all these books, but I'm going to put them on my computers. I, there's so doggone many things. Uh, a Guide to Becoming Rich. Uh, <laughs> you, you want that book? I'll give it to you. And here's the seven levels of communication, Michael Maher. That's quite a book. We've had classes on that stuff here. Yeah, Todd just, uh, we just talked about it a few minutes ago on the webinar, Michael Mayer's book, Seven Levels of Communication. Fantastic book. It is a fantastic book. And if you use it, especially a team, if you got eight, nine people on your team and you read this thing and then make people responsible for what they're supposed to be responsible for. It's a wonderful book, the new birth order book. Eh, I don't know what that's all about. My wife got it, and I didn't read it. But uh, anyway, um, uh, O. Henry, I got an O. Henry book. Anyway, I got books, if anybody wants one. And it uh, looks like uh, this is my 31st year here at West USA. I just started it last week, my 31st year. Congratulations, so Bob. I don't know if... Uh, that's amazing because you only look about 35 years old. I got to admit I'm 45. <laughs> <laughs> I'm older than you. Imagine that. Well, um, the other thing is, is uh, somebody's wanting adult community advisory and addendum. They asked me if they could use some of these other companies' stuff. I, I said, well, yeah, if there's uh, questions in there and you, you need to do something like that, you you could do that, get their name out of there. But Weimar is working on one, uh, West Maricopa Association of Realtors, an adult community advisory and addendum. As a, I don't know if it's very good or not. I, I see we have one page here, but they don't have it out yet. So I would suggest we... Uh, make do until that time comes but uh, sun city's got a whole bunch of stuff i've always said go ahead and sign them um because it it's quite a disclosure there's this one um, maria sent me four pages of some of this stuff and we don't happen to have one other thing we've got here selling an arcadia green residence down in arcadia and this is just one spot, but we've got it right here. Did you know that if you sell one of those residences in there in the HOA rules and regulations there, that they are to offer that same property to all of the owners of Arcadia Green. And if somebody wanted to buy it, they have the first right of refusal on that. And I can't get lawyers or anybody to comment on this much. So uh, I, I don't know where that's going to go. We'll, we'll find out later. But that's uh, I, I don't know what the purpose of something like yeah. it is. But. 
All right, Bob, we appreciate it as always. Do uh, you remember this young lady right here? Which? Oh, yeah, Betty Davis. Oh, yes, yes. I, I dated her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we leave you with the quote of the day from Betty Davis. The key to life is accepting challenges. Once someone stops doing this, he's dead. Appreciate everybody joining us today. Go out and sell a home. <laughs>